record. Everybody, thank, thank you so you. much for joining I us this morning. Run. Sorry, James. So um, just hit record. That's all right. Now. And I'm just going to say a huge welcome to um, Michelle and James from CSU Health. Thank you so much for giving us your time this morning. For anybody that hasn't met us before, um, my name is Rose, I'm the Community Manager for Grow Remote. So we're a nonprofit with the mission of making remote work local. We do that in a number of different ways. Uh, one of the ways is by hosting an event like this, getting information that's out there that's very, very useful to people who are remote working or interested in remote working. Um, we also have our chapters all across the globe now at this stage, um, but we are quite focused in around Ireland. This is where we started. Um, we have training courses, all sorts of different things. Come and join us, have a look at growmost.ie and you can find out more about the conversation. Um, without further ado, I am going to hand over to James and Michelle and thank you both so very much for joining us this morning. Um, absolutely so excited. No, it's a, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let me start off by introducing myself. I'm James Slater. I work with Michelle for Sisu Health and we're a digital health company. We um, I guess we focus on trying to help people to own their health really and take responsibility for it. And as part of that, we have a range of sort of tools from uh, essentially machines that, that do basic health checks through to online platform that help, you know, help people to um, make changes, make lifestyle changes. Um, for my sins, I am head of sales for Sisu, but my background is actually health coaching um, and a psychiatric social worker. Uh, and I've been with um, Sisu since 2014 when it started. Uh, and prior to that, I worked in the sort of EAP world and the education world. Um, EAP meaning employee assistance programs. Um, so I'm sort of coming to this with a particular take on, on having worked in this area of resilience. I'll, I'll just let Michelle introduce herself quickly. Hello everyone and um, it's great to be here this morning. Thank you Rose and thanks everyone for joining. Um, um, and yes, as, as James mentioned, um, I'm also from CSU Health Group and I come with a background in um, nutrition and um, I suppose I work with CSU Health Group with regards to doing a little bit of sales but business development in growing that piece again with regards to how to impact someone's life, how to give them the tools in order for them to make changes and change behavior. Um, coming from my own background, I know that by using certain um, tools and measuring um, uh, with regard to um, different types of measurement metrics, you can make, you know, acknowledge, understand where you are and change uh, different things. So I come here today with my nutrition head on uh, to share some knowledge with you um, and in combination there with James. So I um, hope you enjoy it. And as I said, as Rose mentioned, if any questions, we'll, um, we'll answer them hopefully there towards the end. Thank you. And, and Michelle will be doing a, and I'll be doing a relay. So I'll do the first part of the webinar and hand over to Michelle for the second part. Um, so let me start out with uh, providing with uh, just just what we're going to sort of focus on here. And I've, I've had to draw heavily this morning on my own resilience. Uh, I was due to run a, another webinar this morning at 8.30 and the technology just went to pieces around me. <laughs> Um, so I, I had to draw heavily on it, but what, what I'd like to do is a number of things really is, is first of all, define resilience and identify sort of role in the sort of current climate. A uh, lot of hype at the moment about resilience. You'll see a lot in the sort of press. You'll see a lot in business press. You'll see all sorts of things about resilience. And I, and I, want, I want you to have a, uh, what I would call a skeptical head on as you're listening to me, really, and, and sort of challenge some of it. Um, want to look at the importance of mindset in terms of build, building resilience, because what we know is that certain things and certain ways of being and thinking anchor people into resilience. And then look at some of the key dimensions of personal resilience. And then we're going to sort of anchor that really into some sort of physical capacity. So Michelle is going to talk around sort of food, energy and performance as, as one part of that matrix. 
because in the time we've got, we're not going to cover all. Happy to do questions at the end. So if you've got questions, fire them in. I think Rose will will just sort of keep a log of those um, and we can sort of pick those up really as we go. Uh, probably uh, half an hour, 40 minutes for Michelle and I leave time at the end for sort of questions. So. Uh, jumping over too many slides. Um, I guess we, if one looks at the press, the, you know, the words that come to mind are full of hyperbole, really, in terms of unprecedented times, all of us being challenged, all of us being pushed to the edge of our capacity. And I guess that's partly why resilience has sort of dropped into the middle of helping people think about how we manage this context. It's something being used by governments, it's something being used by businesses, it's something being used in a whole range of different contexts really. And historically, um, resilience sort of comes out of a sort of engineering really and, and originally applied to metals that were flexible but would bounce back into shape and it got taken up really in the sort of I think really 40s and 50s um, within psychology as a way of thinking around how people survive trauma particularly people coming out of the holocaust and survivors and then later children surviving very damaged families and there were there were a number of key aspects to that at the time that psychologists were asking they were asking the question of why were some people able to survive the holocaust and to go on to thrive and lead normal lives and why were other people not able to do that uh, your classic example is somebody like um, you may be familiar with him is Viktor Frankl who went on to I guess, reflect very much on his experience there. Um, and, and so this question began to sort of form around what was it that gave people the capacity to manage what were effectively traumatic, very stressful, ongoing experiences and go on to lead normal lives? How, what was the difference between those two, the people who did and the people who didn't? And that's where the research around resilience really first took hold. It, it was subsequently taken up really very much in the sort of business community. And, and some of the uh, definitions you're seeing on screen there are very much from that sort of business context. Uh, we often associate it with this ability to bounce back and recover quickly, the ability to remain productive, and the ability to learn, transform, and thrive. Now, they're very appealing concepts to the business community, because who wouldn't want employees who had all those qualities? But actually, if we strip it back a little, we, we, when we talk about resilience, we, we're looking at a sort of process where people adapt where to challenging life experiences and adapt both their mental, emotional and behavior to be quite flexible. And, and the metaphor that's often used is uh, a sort of tree in the wind, a very strong um, oak tree with a very strong thick base will stand in full force of the wind, whereas a, a, a smaller sapling will bend with the wind and is more likely to survive. Um, I'm sitting in the west of Ireland here and there was a hell of a storm last night and I thought some of the windows were gonna go here really in the house I'm in. Um, but, it, but it's become associated with that ability to flex, that ability to respond in a way that goes with whatever pressure rather than tries to fight it or resist it and and there are various ways of looking at it which we'll sort of come on to and and some of the early research was looking at was there something genetic almost was there something about those people that were different than the other people um, how much of it was learned 
how much of it was related to personality. And, you know, we began to get different sort of theories. Now, I, I think key to it though, has become very much in the research. And, and if any of you are interested in the research details, happy to send them to you after this, rather than to go into any references now. But, but, but key to it became over time that actually once they began to look at it it was about learning from experience that the people that were seen to be most resilient had a way of processing their experience so that from an initial tough experience they took the learning on to the next experience and the third and the fourth and be began to see that as resilience so they could draw on their previous experience, draw on resources, were able to, um, I think the French used a term called bricolage, which was, you know, you make, do and mend really around an experience initially and, and you try to manage it as best you can uh, and, and develop your skills. Now, that's a very good way of thinking about it. What it doesn't, what, what it seems to imply though, is one is always moving to this experience of resilience when I think the other side of this research suggests that some experiences, even with people who are very resilient, do flatten them. But it's that ability to get up again and that ability to, to, to revive is, is one way of approaching it. Uh, people have also looked at resilience as a process uh, rather than an end state. So, um, and again, very much in the sort of business context and, and I guess in organizational psychology about, about thriving, not just surviving. And, and very often this is a term that's used around resilience programs, resilience courses. But again, key, key to people's resilience, uh, I think research identifies, has always been able to draw on other people to help the ability to ask for help, the ability to recognize when you need help. And the not to, not to adopt that heroic role that I can manage this, I know what I'm doing, you know, throw it at me and I'll sort of manage it. Um, and, and the sort of research began to really focus on a number of things really, it began to focus on people's physical flexibility, endurance and strength. And, and it, it's quite difficult to be resilient when you're not well. Uh, it's not impossible, but it's quite difficult. The, the ability- Sorry, James. Sorry? Just a moment. The slides I don't think are moving Aren't they? for us. Right, okay. Apologies, thank you. Which slide can you see at the moment, Rose? Still the very first one. Still the very first one. Um, yeah. So if you want to maybe stop sharing and try resharing again. Yeah, I will do it. And sorry to break your flow. No, no, no not at all, Rose. It's important to know these things. Um, just, just as you're doing that, actually, I have the um, poll that you wanted to run on um, around uh, coping ability. So if everybody wants to go to menti.com for a moment, and I'll give you the code. So I'll call out the code now in just a moment, but I'm also putting it in the chat. And we just have a question there around um, around people. Oh, sorry, Michelle, sending it to you individually. So the code, if you're gone to menti.com, is 2885776. So if you do get a chance to pop to menti.com, it's 2885776. So, Rose, are the slides moving now? They are, James, yeah. We are because, now, yeah, thanks, so, James. We're on le learning from experience. Right, so can you see resilience as a process, yeah? Yes. Okay, don't know what happened there. But I'll draw on my resilience. Uh, just coming back to this, so, so research began to focus on really four areas, the sort of physical, the mental, emotional, and the spiritual. And one of the things that seemed to make a difference really in terms of whether Sunday was resilient or not, 
was their sense of coherence across these four areas. Uh, being able to uh, incorporate multiple views, having a, a sense of strength and endurance, uh, having the emotional capacity to flex, and very importantly, and it's, and it's coming through all the research, is the ability to anchor yourself in a sort of moral, spiritual view of what you're doing, why you're doing it. And I'm not talking about necessarily a religious point of view, which can be part of that, but, but having a, a clear view of why you're doing something and what your moral stance is in relation to it. And that seems to make a significant difference um, in that sort of context. I, I'm, I'm just going to step outside of resilience a minute just to um, think about a couple of other areas that relate to it. And particularly in the current context, really, um, you will have seen a lot in the press about uh, people talking about sort of a, an impending tsunami of mental health issues as a result of how we're all having to manage a very different sort of context. And, and, and part of me is quite skeptical of that, but also I think there is some evidence that um, where people are struggling. And, and if we look at the sort of population generally, and um, some of this comes from the UK and um, the, uh, the, the Office of National Statistics, who, who do regular reviews really of how people see themselves. Then there, there tends to be a number of categories. There, there are about 25% of people who would put themselves in the thriving, flourishing category. There's another 50% in the middle that put themselves in the sort of moderate physical health, mental health, what's called languishing, struggling category. And then there's about another 25% who see themselves as uh, physically unwell or, or maybe suffering more severe mental health issues around anxiety, depression, and some of the more serious conditions. And the reality is, I think we all sort of move positions at times. You know, we're all moving between some of these positions. So there's a there's a temporal quality to it. And you know, we can we you know we can be over right here, but we can also be moving back. And if we're looking at uh, if we're looking at that in terms of um, what I would call the well-being spectrum of the population. So you've got that 25% in the flourishing, that 50% in the middle, and that other 25% who are struggling at the sort of far side of this. And, and this seems to be true for most populations uh, in terms of where people are. Then, then one, of the, one of the thoughts is that the, the sort of impact of COVID has begun to push this curve to the right, at the right as I'm looking at the screen. Um, so that it, it's pushing all of our boundaries rightwards. So the people, some more people in flourishing moving into the sort of moderate, more people in the languishing mental disorders moving into the more severe categories. And it, it's sort of this space here where we're probably going to see the most challenges, I think, for health services and, and uh, for employers, I think, in terms of, um, uh, we've had whole populations that have been, I mean, uh, been flung into working from home who've not chosen to work from home. You know, I know most of you guys work remotely, so have some experience of that. But certainly in the UK, we're seeing lots of people have been flung into home working without the facilities, with managing the people they share houses with, with managing the homeschooling, with managing a lack of structure that they got from work. So it's pushing, it's pushing those boundaries. And I think it's here we'll begin to see, you know, where, where those um, conditions begin to impact on people's abilities really to, to function effectively. If we, if we put that in, in the context of uh, pressure performance, stress and burnout, uh, again, fairly typical pressure performance curve, You'll, you know, most of you will be familiar with this, that 
for most of us, our optimal performance sits around this cusp point. You know, and very often we're moving up and down through this stretch strain back into comfort. Again, one of the things that's happened that probably in the last 20, 30 years is there's, there's less downtime for most people. Work has impinged into home life. Uh, we're always on. You know, these challenges have always been on, but, you know, particularly, and that's been added to by the sort of current crisis. And I think that's when we, we begin to see the things we associated with fatigue, poor judgment, poor decision making, and we begin to see this breakdown and sort of burnout. And in a business context, resilience has often been associated with this cusp point. How do you help people work across this? What works, what doesn't work without them crashing down into here? And, and certainly um, working sort of 10, 15 years ago with, with Glaxo Schmidt's client, I was part of a sort of coaching team with them. They, they changed the psycho psychological contract with employees. They said, look, we'll do everything we can to support you in the workplace, but the pressure of work is not going to go away. So you need to do something for yourself. And they began to put a lot of emphasis on the idea of resilience, the idea of helping people to manage themselves in a different way. And it was really at that point, I guess, uh, a lot of resilience programs sort of took off as people were beginning to do that. And out of, out of some of that work and out of subsequent research, a, a number of things sort of emerged really in terms of thinking about resilience. The, the states of mind were very important. The, I, I think the evidence certainly from America and, and particularly Bar Barbara Fredrickson's research and the whole psychology movement, the whole positive psychology movement has shown, I think, that where people are positive, they, they tend to be, and I say tend to be, and this is where I think the skepticism needs to be, because tend to be much more engaged, much more motivated, and are able to move between this engaged and relaxed, calm position. Where people were struggling with um, more negative emotions and the revolving around the head of chunt, what I would call chuntering around things. Am I doing the right thing? Am I working this properly? You began to see much more frustration, anger, defeat, hopelessness. So it beca became this, this idea of positive mindset began to come together with sort of energy in, in a way that was, was new in this area of psychology. And the sort of question would be, how do you help people stay over here? How do you help people move here? We all need to move into these parts ourselves, the defeated side, of, you know, that's, that's part of being human. You can't avoid it. And we, do, we shouldn't avoid it because there are also important warning signs for us that things are not right in our life. But they beca became in sort of important. Um, sorry, wrong way. Um, and so what they began to do is, is the idea of a, a sort of resilient mindset began to develop. And, and there were things around that, around the ability to be flexible about how you approach things, problem solving, humor, having a perspective, which having a set of, you know, good moral values helps, you know, am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing this? positive attitude, recognizing, managing thoughts and emotions. So that, that what I would call that emotional intelligence, the, the ability to manage your own emotions rather than necessarily always act on them. Uh, Self-acceptance and what has become known as realistic optimism, not, not the happy clappy, I'm really happy, but realistic optimism and facing the reality of situations. And, and that research very much tuned with the early research really around what helped people to survive. Sorry. And, and so what we began to get is, is um, a framework for resilience. 
um, and I'll hand over to Michelle in a moment, but, but that was very much around taking care of your body. Are you eating properly? Are you sleeping properly? Are you moving properly? Are you, in, you know, engaging with your body in a proper way? Uh, and that became very much our business at Sisu. Social connection became very important. Are you able to ask for help? Are you able to reach out to other people and utilize other resources? And that's quite significant in resilience. I think one of the things you see very often when people sort of crumble is the inability, and it's more true of men than women, I have to say, the ability to ask for help when you need it and to recognize you need help. This bottom part of values and purpose, having the values and purpose that anchor you into something more solid in your life. And then having what they call a self-care mindset, being able to both be kind to yourself, be kind to others, being able to know when you need to step back and step away. So this began to be the frame for that. And we've not got time in this webinar to go into the detail, but what I'm going to do is hand over to Michelle, because I think the increasing evidence is, is that physical capacity is a very important capacity to that. And I'll now hand over to Michelle. Great, James. And thank you so much, because I think um, what you've mentioned in, in a couple of different areas, number one is anchoring. Um, and that's key to grounding ourselves with what's around us. Um, and number two is that whole, how do we avoid the stress and the burnout um, to build those resilient tools over time? And coming from, I suppose, where I come from, which is the nutrition side and having gone back to college to study nutrition, I was in also in a burnout phase when I um, had um, my first baby. And it was when um, he was about nine months old and continuously crying and couldn't understand why this was happening. For me, I'd been in a corporate environment. I'd been working, you know, the, the long hours um, and then to be thrown into this, um, I suppose, first baby scenario and that whole piece of being not knowing where or what to do at different stages was it was just totally unknown to me. Um, I, I then decided that because he was so um, he was so sick at the time to go back to college and to retrain as a nutritionist to learn how to do that. This brought me the steps to be able to build those resilient pieces and put them together in order to avoid the stress and the burnout and to avoid that crisis and that strain piece that James was talking about. And all those make a huge area. We will come in our lives to areas that we don't know and haven't got the experience to manage. But what we can do is understand how to learn about it and if we can build on it slowly and talking to Rose earlier was a fact that you know we've come up against various different technologies over the last nine months and again we have to learn it uh, in order to survive it so today I thought I'd bring nutrition into this because I think it's a vital part in feeling well and building our um, our overall anchor to thrive and survive and be able to withstand any challenge. And why is that? Because when we take in the good nutrients, our body functions as well as it can. Um, every body is different, every stamp is different, you know, because we have our own stamp, we have our own genetic um, follow through, we'll have our mom, our dads, or whatever genetic background we have, and that will be part of us. Now we can change it as we grow, because we can change the food that we take in, and we can change ourselves emotionally and physically as well with regards to um, how we manage situations, as Jane mentioned. So how I define nutrition is, and how are we nutritionally, um, is our performance, number one, are we physically and mentally, you know, feeling well? Do we have enough energy every day to get out of bed, to feel that we, you know, thrive during the day? Do we have that? Or are we coming to the to the time in the afternoon and really wilting or, you know, what is our, 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 our health like overall? Do we have any signs of symptoms? Do we have weight gain over the last kind of two lockdowns, which is a huge factor um, at the moment? Have we got high cholesterol? Have we, you know, heart trouble with regards to, um, you know, 
you know, uh, our family members having, you know, strokes in the past, do we need to be conscious of that? Or do we have high blood pressure? Um, and are we stressed? And this can be a huge factor when we're working continuously, remotely, or, you know, um, at home, and we've been thrown into a situation that we're not used to, or, again, you know, the whole scenario as you know, are we stressed? Are we, you know, in that kind of total cycle environment? And again, our lifespan, are we feeling good generally in our cells or how do we feel so um we'll just go on to the next slide there james so nutrition is all about that how do we feel in general so i thought i'd talk to you today about the food curve and you can say what is that okay so i'm just going to throw out a poll there to, with regards to um again you know do you eat three meals a day with regards to you know, balanced meals. Are you eating a breakfast in the morning? Are you eating a lunch? Are you eating a meal in the evening at the regular times? Or are you skipping breakfast and then going straight into lunch? Or are you skipping lunch and going straight into breakfast at 12 o'clock? Or, you know, are you having your meal time at eight, nine o'clock in the evening? How are you eating? And this is what I call the balanced food curve because this has a huge effect on our blood and on our sugar that's going into our body. And why is this? Because our blood sugar balance really reflects on how we feel throughout the day. And it can be, you know, when we say we've got low energy, when we say we're not mentally, physically able to, to you know, to, to do certain tasks, or that our well being is low, it can be an excess of anti nutrients like coffee continuously or high sugars being put, you know, being. Uh, consumed in the diet or it can be that we consume a lot of man-made chemicals and this has been happening since the 1950s um, and even with regards to prescription and antibiotics you know one in I suppose um, in in um, it's I suppose nine out of ten when it comes to anyone that would suffer with arthritis and that would be on medication. Yes, it's going to maintain the pain, but the drugs have a long term effect on the actual body. Um, again, hormone residues um, very much has an effect with regards to are we taking in you know different type of plastics, you know, with regards to the hormones in the plastics or. You know, how is our body affected by all of these um, different areas? Um, you know, vitamin D is a huge factor at the moment because the sun is, you know, we're not getting enough of it. And, you know, one in eight people, which is about 13 percent of the older generation now suffer with a different uh, deficiency in vitamin D. And hence they can be more, um, shall we say, um, factor which comes to the COVID and they're the most vulnerable. So again, that whole disease factor causing the pain, causing the muscle, the fatigue, the weight gain goes back to the balancing the food curve. And the, you know, the, the green line that you can see underneath is when the food curve is balanced Hence, you're taking in three regular meals during the day. You're balancing your food throughout the day. Hence, the yellow line that's going up over the green line and it's going out of balance. That's when we, the, the glucose that we're taking in throughout the day is going to a spike and dropping where we feel that we, you know, might like to take in some, um, you know, sugars to bring us back up again and then the whole cycle continues throughout the day and this can be you know a factor where it comes to 11 o'clock and we're craving our coffee and we're looking for that spike and then the body just literally um consumes that glucose and um what happens then is that 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 low comes and we go again for that sugar and that glucose craving so we're just going to go on to um so what was the poll do we get an answer on the poll rose with regards to how people are eating you know throughout yes. so most of us aren't okay myself included. okay okay so there's a couple of people who are and then but the majority okay aren't. okay well really good to know that because when we understand and acknowledge that we're not eating three meals a day, it's important to say, how do we do that better? How do we avoid the stress and the burnout? Okay, so today I'm going to show you how to do that easily and you know effortlessly kind of throughout your day. So we're going to start with, I suppose, a plate. And this is kind of 11 inch plate that I've kind of taken. And I'm just going to, um, 
put a mark on it. Okay, so I'm just going to cut the plate in half. If I can get there, yeah. Um, yeah, cut the plate in half. So we're just going to, you know, I suppose I always say we're going to just eat the veg on half of the plate. And the veg is all about looking at um, our non-starchy veg, which would be all our green veg, um, salads, um, looking at, you know, tomatoes, carrots, all those kind of good um, vegetables. You can eat as much of them as you like. OK, so then we have um, we have a quarter of the plate and I'm just going to um, you can see that there, which is protein and protein very much is a building factor which really supports our repair in our body for all our muscles and all the function of our body to provide us with good energy. And then the last is the carbs. OK, so we're going to look at kind of good, you know, starchy carbohydrates, which can be anything from like brown rice, fiber in the bread, the brown bread, the rye bread, the sourdough bread. And these can be um, a great factor because they give us um, those nutrients like a sweeping brush to brush out all the anti-nutrients in the body. So, and then we have a little slither here, which is called, as we know it, fat, okay? So fat is key as well, because when we eat protein and just even fat together on their own, it really slows down that release of sugar into the body uh, and it stops those cravings hence you know an example of that would be where we would eat um, an apple and we would have some nuts with it or if you had breakfast you could have something like overnight oats um, if you've ever heard of those you just put um, some oats into um, a bowl and you can either cover it with you know milk or you can cover it with um, with water and you can add something like chia seeds blueberries and kind of natural yogurt and that's a great way to balance all those nutritious foods together for lunch you could have something like tuna apple salad or a green salad again really simple and bringing in some fiber which could be your brown sliced bread um, or your, your 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 rye bread or your sourdough bread all really uh, applicable to avoiding the stress and the burnout and that whole crisis and that strain because when we put all those nutrients together it releases the sugar evenly throughout the day. So we're not spiking, we're not craving, and we're not going into that stress response where our body kind of goes, I can't make a decision, I don't know what to do. And we feel that, you know, I need to, um, I need time out. Whereas if we're eating healthy like this continuously, and especially around now, because we've lots of things to finish off before year end, we have those tasks kind of coming in. So the more we eat regularly throughout the day, the better we feel at the end of the day. <clears throat> and just note yourself. Do you have cravings at lunchtime? Do you have cravings more or less around 11, 4 o'clock and in the evening? Are you snacking on, you know, sweets and treats at the moment? Or are you taking in kind of, you know, a good slice up an apple in the evening? Have some nuts on the side. Have those type of foods around. And one of the ways is to be prepared uh, with regards to getting those foods in um, over the next few days. When you're doing your shopping, make sure you do your food shop for work and having those sweets, you know, those, those definitely those good pieces of fruit and veg bowls on the table as well has a huge factor. So when we eat in balance, it really imbalances our sugar and our flow throughout the day. So we're just going on to the next slide there now. And that's, this will actually kind of give us the portion sizes. And I like this because it really makes it really simple. So what portion sizes do you eat? You know, what I was showing you there is probably, you know, a simple kind of way of looking at it. But also when we look at the hands, um, it really is, this is relative to the size of the person as well, um, that the portions that they take in. So definitely looking at protein, the palm of the hand, whether you're male or female, it's relative to the size of your hand. Two palms with regards to those vegetables, getting them in, you know, every day. They really ask, you know, I suppose, work as an anti-nutrient, but they also provide um, good nutrients with regards to fiber and um, with regards to um, 
good um, vegetables to be able to, you know, those rainbow vegetables that you can get into your diet every day. Also looking at a fat with regards to, you know, um, it can be olive oil or it can be a nut butter or coconut oil or olive oil or, um, you know, you know, our butter, real good butter can be great as well. Um, and also the starchy carbohydrates. So just looking at a fistful is plenty on the plate. So if you take a fistful, if you're eating for one, you know, obviously, you know, the one fist, if you're eating for two, the two fists um, of, you know, even just taking an example of brown rice. And that can be a great way to to measure it into the pot with regards to what you're going to cook up for that day. Um, and again, noting your portion sizes kind of on your plate as well. So um, we'll just go on to the next slide there with regards to what kind of foods am I looking at here and what kind of samples. So looking at the protein um, and there's many vegetarians out there as well. So it doesn't have to be meat always. So looking at your nuts and your seeds, your pulses, um, you know, these are great ways to get your nutrients in. Fiber, you can look at something like the chia seeds. It has protein and it has fiber and something like a flaxseed. Um, uh, linseed is the same kind of uh, word, but flaxseed, you know, very similar. Um, with regards to the nuts and pulses as well, great source of protein, good healthy fats, you know, something like salmon, uh, coconut oil and avocado on some, you know, brown bread is a great way to get those nutrients in. Starchy carbs, I've mentioned them with regards to the brown breads are a great way, you know, make sure you're getting that in kind of during the day and also you know a great source is brown rice and also brown uh, pasta another good source to build your body to produce the energy that you want during the day and this makes you um, shall we say, survive for longer because those energy foods, which is in the protein, which is in the fat, um, and those carbs gives us that energy um, when it all kind of comes together and that release of glucose evenly throughout the day. Um, and then the non-starches, which is something like, you know, a butternut squash at the moment is very popular. You know, cutting that up, putting it into the oven, baking it is a great way um, to add that to your, you know, to your salmon uh, with little small new potatoes the bigger potato does tend to have to be part of the nightshade family which does if anyone is suffering from that little bit of arthritis can increase you know and that uh, that pain so just avoiding those bigger you know kind of bigger potatoes Irish potatoes as we call them and sticking to kind of the smaller ones is better and more beneficial also looking at um something like there's the zucchini there, which is the American form. We call it courgette here and spiralize it. You can buy those in supermarkets now. And so easy to add to a salad as well with brown rice, you know, and you can prep that the day before. So definitely getting all those kind of vegetables at one sitting in, um, in, 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 you know, your lunchtime or in your evening meal is a great way. Um, and definitely, you know, when we look at all these kind of foods put together, they have a, um, a great impact when it comes to um, what I call is the overall blood sugar balance, which correlates with our circadian rhythm, which is our night and day. When we wake up, we should be alert and that follows the light during the day. And when we go to bed, we should be tired and ready for the bed. And these all have a great factor. And this will you know, come through in the next slide, which when we talk about the sleep and the hormones. You know, when we're waking up in the middle of the night, I don't know, is anybody, is anybody sleeping, you know, through the night or do you wake up during the middle of the night? Um, or do you get that kind of stark feeling in the middle of the night thinking, oh my God, I forgot something or you just wake up and you can't get back to sleep. Hence, this is the blood sugar during the day. If you're eating too much sugar or glucose during the day, it has a knock on effect at nighttime. And why is this? Because we have two hormones that actually are released at nighttime, which is leptin and gremlin. And these two hormones correlate with our hormones during the day. And it really supports our night and day circadian rhythm, our overall um, hormonal balance. So if, you know, if we're working to those, they all kind of sync together. It's not just about uh, eating, you know, the different foods. It's about balancing the blood sugar, which has a huge effect on our confidence, a huge effect on um, 
our stress responds a huge effect on our overall weight and that kind of bloatingness around the belly so getting that right during the day has a huge effect on our sleep and um, our hormone balance at nighttime. So making sure you get a good night's sleep because it really repairs every function in the body, our organs, our liver, um, our kidneys, you know, our heart, you know, it's repairing at nighttime and that's what it does and that's what it's supposed to do. So getting those seven or eight hours a night is key. So how can we do that better? Try to get an early to bed if you can at the same time, Monday to Friday, especially in your work routine. It can really support you. Um, keeping the room dark as well. No phones on, no lights on as well. Just going into that really kind of quiet space. Um, spending time outdoors as well if you can. 15 minutes, 20 minutes during the day to get a little bit of light into your eyes or into your, into your soul. Um, and try to relax again, you know, coming into that bedtime not being in, um, you know, watching something that's really dramatic, you know, but being in a quiet zone like reading uh, might be a good way to do that. Or meditation is also a good way to kind of wind the body down, to go into that sleep naturally and keep your hands and your feet warm as well. Make sure that you're warm um, because, again, that's all going into that winding down and making sure that we're in the right zone to sleep. So going on to, I suppose, how do we, you know, take in water and a poll there I just wanted to ask everybody was with regards to um our water again you know and and how much water are we getting in during the day again this is a key factor to increase our energy but not just our energy it works on our focus our concentration and just replenishing um the fluid within our body we can you know live without food but we can't live without water because it takes up our brain, it takes up our blood, heart, bones, muscles, liver and kidneys. These operate at optimum level when we take in enough and efficient water. Now, one of the questions that was asked before was, you know, can I drink too much water? And some people would need more and some people would need less. If we're working in an environment where we're physical and we're actually, you know, using up a lot of our fluids, well, then we should be taking in more during the day. If, for instance, we're kind of sitting down all day and we're using up a lot of brain um, function with regards to detail, you know, our concentration needs to be on that. We need to be taking in our water during the day. And definitely, if our brain is taking in 75 percent and we're using it up mentally, well, then we will need to be replenishing that. That water in order for our brain to work and function at optimum and as well to help to excrete that fluid um you know during the day um, and again you know when we go um to the toilet you know definitely excreting those anti-nutrients those toxins as well you know it really supports that function as well so we don't want fluid retention we want just that fluid to be um you know, um, shall we say, replenished and then excreted, you know, through the day. And the same with our bowel function as well. That all needs to be working, you know, efficiently, getting the fiber, getting the water in. It increases. And again, it goes back to anchoring yourself, transforming and thriving every day. And these are the habits that we can do to build that. And that does take time. Um, so as James mentioned, when we go through various different resilience pieces in our life, which can be a big part of what we, you know, is different phases, you know, we might we get married or we might there might be a death in our family and these will bring us all through different phases but how do we come back out of it and having a good diet and having you know a good structure in place you know definitely during your work cycle getting enough sleep drinking enough water eating the proper foods during the day is key key to actually functioning at a better level so i think um how did the poll come back rose did we get um so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite a mix. So a um, certain amount of people, you know, getting up on the five to six or seven to eight. Great. And then, but then about half 
are on one to two. Okay, okay. So definitely how much is needed. So definitely about two litres, I would recommend every day or eight glasses. Um, so for those who are taking in the, you know, the seven or eight, brilliant, that's great. And for those that are on the one and two, try and get it in a little bit more. But again, you'll be taking it in if you're taking in more vegetables or if you're taking in more fruit during the day, that really will support that fluidity as well. Um, so try and up, you know, I would always have a pint of water on my desk or I'd have a bottle in the car or wherever I go, there's always kind of water, um, you know. So, and again, herbal teas can be a great way. When we look at teas and coffee, they dehydrate us. Um, so definitely if you're having a coffee, make sure that you hydrate after it because it really dehydrates. So re replacing. So if you have a coffee, replace it with a pint of water afterwards to so make sure that you're really uh, replenishing the body after you take in certain foods is a great way. So well done to everybody. Um, and, and I think, you know, taking those points there to go back to taking self-care and the mindset that James was talking about, taking care of your body is a key factor for the framework of resilience. Self-care, again, is how do we do that? How can we do that? And building those factors into it, your sleep, your food, um, your, um, your sleep, your food, and definitely bringing in more water are key to the self-care and taking care of your body to build um, that, you know, to build out then so that social piece and also those values and purpose so that you can actually function at, um, at a better level and even at an optimum level. So I think I'll hand over to James now to Thanks, kind of Michelle. finish off that part. Okay. Thanks, okay. Michelle. Um, so just going back to that framework, I mean, obviously we're presenting you a framework there. There's lots to think about lots of detail there and you know we've covered quite a lot in a short period of time i guess for, from our perspective we're very interested in trying to support people to you know to to get that right frame for themselves because whether you call this resilience whether you call it hardiness you know there are all sorts of ways of thinking about it whether you call it good health it's usually that combination of things that are important and uh, as a sort of business our focus is on those tools and, you know, if you're interested, come and talk to us, not trying to do a hard sell, but I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you, James and Michelle. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, Michelle, you, you pretty, you, you, you kind of covered a question Geraldine had about tea and coffee counting towards water intake. But <laughs> um, something I wanted to, to, to build on top of that was, is there other tactics that you see people using around water intake that's really helped? As in how they actually can take in more water or more types of, yeah. yeah. So, you know, some people actually don't like drinking water. They don't like the taste of it, you know. So you can add a fruit juice or, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, of juice, you know, into the, into the water. Or you could even add some herbs, like mint is lovely in water, you know, just to get the flavor going. Also, I would recommend is lemon. You know, when you actually add some nice lemon into water, it really supports the liver. and getting up first thing in the morning is a great way to start the day which would be you know a pint of warm water and some lemon kind of squeezed into it and that really clears out the digestive system and gets the liver working and the enzymes working as well so your body your food is actually broken down um in a better way yeah so um but the you know having the bottle the water bottles i see there some people have them which is great having them around is a great way to get the water in and the teas you know the herbal teas is a great way as well they'd be the main ways and then of course fruit um, you know, apples, pears, they all have a sense of fluid in them. Do you know what I mean? So getting enough of those in. Juicing, I always find is a great way. Not everybody is into, into the juicing, but I find the smoothies are a great way. You know, you just add in maybe some spinach, some nut butter, um, you could put in some blueberries and fill it up with water and add your favorite. Um, and that's a great way. You know, I'd have that maybe twice a day, 11 o'clock. It really cuts out those cravings. Uh, again, a great way to get the fluids in. Great, and thanks that that kind of covers Denny was asking about green tea. Jeremy was just asking about kombucha. Yes, kombucha is a new, shall we say, uh, fermented drink on the market um, in the last couple of years. And what it is, it's a fermented culture that produces uh, kind of a fizz for all the world, like sparkling water but it's 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 actually produced from a culture and this has many 
I suppose, probiotics in it, a type of probiotics and good bacteria in it. So yes, it's great. Start small if you haven't had it before, because sometimes if it can imbalance you, your own system. So start small um, and some people can take it to duck to water uh, and, and other people just have to be mindful as how much they're taking in. So, uh, but great form of, of, of probiotics and a little bit of good bacteria getting in there as well. So keep it up if you can. Uh, yeah, I, I, I used to drink quite a lot more when I was working in the pubs and go, I found it give me a nice kind of energy boost. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, 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 you were just asking about um, chlor chlorinated water, like, the, you know, it's off-putting to drink. And I, I, I'm just wondering, Eugene, is it, you know, you're wondering about, like, its effect on people, is it, or, it, you know, how palatable it is? Well, the chlorinated water that comes out so, of yeah, the tap. Yeah, he, he was just... Yeah, yeah. So would you be suggesting maybe to, to buy? I actually watched a really interesting uh, piece on this um, on Netflix around water and its makeup. Um, what's the name of the actor? I can't think of a young American actor, but it's really, really interesting that piece actually around water makeup and, you know, mineralized water. I came, I, I came across mineralized water first properly when I was in Slovenia and it, it's quite strong tasting. I think, it's you know, if you're not used to it, but it's obviously got a lot of really good stuff. Um, I, I had heartburn and there was no pharmacies open on a Sunday. And that was the, that was the thing that was recommended to me and it really helped. It really helped, yeah. And, 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 and it can, you know, the, I suppose the different types of water, but if you can get a filtered water, it, it really supports the overall. And, not, and there will be other waters out there that have minerals in them that come from the underground within their premises. Do you know what I mean? Um, but um, and they can really have a beneficial effect with regards to adding extra minerals like magnesium, phosphorus. You know, they really support your overall kind of well-being. Um, if you can boil the water, if you know, if the water isn't right coming out of the tap, you know what I mean? And, you know, use the use that instead or buy, you know, you can buy um a water but make sure it's coming from a good source you know um a, a, you know a good you know bought water um you know can, can, is a you know is a good way as well but just make sure it's coming from a good source and that you have it's recommended and actually just one of the ones i i, I sketched on myself because i see a lot coming out around vitamin d supplementation and and the, you know the, a lot of us are quite low particularly in the northern hemisphere have you got uh, folks any recommendations on supplements to use or what to watch out for Yes, there's the deluxe one, which is very simple. It's a spray. It's about that size and it's a spray and you can just spray it on your tongue. It comes in kind of a thousand, um, you know, IU recommendation. And that would be at the moment, it probably would be the best one to, to kind of take for um, for definitely for older people. And yeah, for everybody, really, at the moment, I would recommend a vitamin D supplement um, because it's so dark in the morning and dark in the evening and we're not getting that sun intake and it has a great effect on our hormones as well with regards to our overall kind of um well-being with regards to our chest and our um uh, the lungs it has a correlation directly with the lungs so definitely getting a supplementation of vitamin d especially if you're in you know the older generation um you know we are maybe more prone to different kind of ailments but um I would recommend and you might need a kind of a higher dose but if you have got your vitamin d tested it's great but if you don't you know definitely take in vitamin d and eggs can can um, definitely go for an organic egg or a free range egg has vitamin d in it as well do you know what i mean and choline in it as well all great for the overall kind of um vitamin d supplementation so um yeah so the deluxe one is fine. It's really small. It's cheap enough as well. And you can do it in, in different IUs. But I'd start off with definitely 500 to 1,000. That's great, Michelle. Thanks. Um, Margaret's just asking about the bottled water from Aldir Lidl. Is it not OK? And should I be buying a better one? Um, <laughs> I, I, I actually have, I haven't looked at it, to be quite honest. Um, I would imagine, you know, it, it's fine. It'll be, you know, the standard water um, that you buy. But um, and I think it would be absolutely fine. I'd have to have a look at it now, really, to actually see. I haven't actually um, gone in and had a look kind of at the back of it, but I'm sure it's absolutely it's absolutely fine. And if you if you don't feel it's fine, just boil it. And um, yeah, and, and it'll be fine. And sure, isn't there this thing where, you know, it depends on, you know, what's working for you. You could try to optimize everything to the nth degree. Yes. But as long as it's working, it's, it's good enough. 
that's that's a big part. Um, I I recognise we're going to be finishing up now. We're just going over such an interesting topic. But I would love to ask from both of you, um, particularly more, maybe more so on the mindset stuff. Is there anything particular? Um, maybe I'll ask Michelle first, and then Jane that you'd like to recommend to people that you think would be really good around the mindset piece that would help around resilience. Maybe something that you you know you haven't covered here or that you might be like to reiterate. So I'll okay. put that Michelle first. No, that's fine. Thanks, Rose. Um, and, and, and the mindset goes back to um, definitely our intention. Okay. So our intention is key when we have a um, mindset. So if we put out an intention, our actions will follow. And this is, is in anything, any project that we do or any um, area of our life. It doesn't just have to be in work. It can be in any area of our life. So if our intention is that we want to have a healthy goal or we want to lose weight or we want to have increased energy, our intention needs to be there in our mind, um, full on 100%. So if we have the intention, we will then put actions around it. So I would always work, you know, with people and also um, in CSU Health as well, our intention by what we have in measuring with regards to the areas that we measure when we do a HRA, which is a health risk assessment at the start, it's to measure and then say, okay, this is where I am at the moment. And literally write out different areas where you are, i.e. in your health goals or your work goals, and then identify where you want to be. Where do I want to be in 12 weeks time? Where do I want to be in a month's time? Do I want to be healthier? Do I want to lose weight? How much do I want to lose? Be specific. You know, how, where do I want to be in my work environment? Do I want to get up earlier in the morning? You know, how do I want that to look and feel? And then we have to put actions in behind that. Um, and that's what we do at CSU Health in our, you know, in our program, we put in the, the programs behind that, whether it be in the the sleep we have a sleep program and we've also kind of got a weight loss program they're 12 weeks each but and they do the actions then in order to put that in place but the first thing around mindset I would say what is your intention um and I hope that makes sense to a lot of people by having your intention you and then you know putting the actions in place things will then fall um more naturally for you really like that this is one of my, my notes <laughs> be deliberate <laughs> And I, and I think it's the answer to a lot of things, but I, you know, I think it's no harm and it's one of my posters up here. Um, James, I'll pose that to you then. Uh, would there be anything you'd like to expand on or, or add? Um, just a couple of things, really. I think, uh, and going back to the sort of evidence, uh, the evid I mean, the evidence is very clear that having a strong set of values makes a difference when it comes to resilience because it does anchor you into... Um, what you will or won't do and what you will or will not put up with. And, and certainly we see that in, in the business context. And I guess the other thing we haven't addressed really in terms of self-care and mindset is, I, I guess, um, self-gratitude really is, take, you know, be easier on yourself. Because uh, again, that's quite significant, I think, in terms of when people get into that cycle of sort of negative thoughts, it's very often heavily self-critical that goes round and round. And, you know, saying it that way is not always easy to do, but even sort of practicing um, some self-gratitude, some um, self-compassion as well, begins to make a difference. Absolutely love that. And it's a regular conversation for us within Grow Remote. Um, we would tell others, gosh, you did a great thing there. Well, well done, fair play. And then maybe we're slow to actually stop and recognize. So even as a team, we, we, we try our best to say, you know, did you stop and celebrate the fact that you achieved that thing last week? Sure. Or you take that off your list or, um, and, you know, making that part of our values is it's, it's hugely important. Um, Michelle and James, I want to say a huge thanks for coming no, today pleasure. and, and sharing, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, thank you, everybody else, for joining. Um, I will say this is a whole topic that I find extremely fascinating. Um, I've just gotten a little bit more into you know, wellness um, and mental health and stuff in the last years, and it's helped me a huge amount. If anybody's interested in talking more about this, there's a channel in our Slack. I would absolutely spend hours talking about 
all things to do with wellness and whatnot. You'll get me talking about my muscle knots and how I how I try to undo those um, and my journaling. And um, so do please join us with that. Um, the recording of this will be up on our YouTube. I should have that up by tomorrow evening. Um, but I have some information as well to send out from CSU as well. So I send that out to everybody that I register on Eventbrite. If you hadn't and you're looking for the information, you know, just give me a shout and I'll, I'll send that back on to you. So thank you very, very much, everyone. I hope you all have Pleasure. a wonderful Good to meet break. You all. We will see you in a fresh new year <laughs> and look forward to meeting more and more of you face to face in 2021. So thank you so much. Great. Thank everybody. you very much, Rose. Bye. Thank you. Bye.